Welcome back. In a moment, we'll examine some of the largest migrant communities in countries around the world. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. Japan's second largest helicopter carrier, the Kaga, has entered into service in what's being seen as a challenge to China's growing dominance in that region. Japan's constitution limited the country's armed forces to self-defense in the wake of the Second World War. However, recent tensions in the South China Sea have led to a policy shift. A zoo in the Czech Republic has taken the drastic step of soaring off the horns of its rhinos. The decision, which the zoo says will be carried out on all 21 of the rhinos in its care, comes in response to the death of a white rhino in a French zoo earlier this month. His horn was hacked off by poachers. And restoration works have been completed at the tomb where it's believed the body of Jesus Christ was interred after his crucifixion. The restored tomb is part of a $4 million project at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem's Old City. The story of mass migration is not unique to any one continent. The global economy has given workers the chance to search for better opportunities abroad when those at home seem limited. Around the world, mass migration is on the rise, but so too is anti-immigrant sentiment. The UK is the second most popular destination for migrants in Europe. The country's largest immigrant community is Polish and numbers nearly 800,000. The group is so large that Polish is the UK's third most spoken language after English and Welsh. However, Germany is still the continent's most favoured destination for migrants. The country has made a reputation for itself as a welcoming location for foreign nationals. The largest immigrant community is Turkish, with approximately one and a half million Turks living in Germany. The United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and Qatar all have large migrant populations. Almost all of the foreign-born workers come from India, Bangladesh, Pakistan and Nepal and support private sectors throughout the Arab Peninsula. These countries have small native populations and great sovereign wealth and require an influx of workers to support large infrastructure projects. And there is much debate over the future of Mexican-American immigration. Some 12 million Mexican workers live in the United States. President Donald Trump has promised to deport many of them and to build a wall along the two countries' shared border. Well, let's discuss this. I'm joined by Idil Osman, who's a research associate at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and still with us is the Africa analyst, Tamsin Kajou. Um, it, it used to be the case, it was very simple. Somebody moved to another country, a big decision, in search of a better, economically more prosperous life. Is that still the case? Partly, um, globalization has facilitated a lot of different types of migration. One of them that's still persisting is the economic migrants. So we've still got a lot of people uh, coming from um, Asia, for example. You've got the Filipino community who's actually, uh, it's become part of their uh, government strategy to have Filipino migrants come to the Middle East, to Europe, uh, to be able to provide better economic um, situations for their families back home. But now we also have uh, asylum seekers fleeing conflict. We've got uh, asylum Asylum seekers and refugees that are fleeing um, climate change issues, so natural disasters, those that are fleeing from uh, uh, drought and, and natural disasters that are happening in their homelands. So the, the migration types and the, the, the landscape of, of root causes and drivers has become a lot more complex now. And the communities that host those immigrants, do they react differently to those different groups, do you think, Tamsin? They, they react differently, um, depending on where those communities are. If you are talking about uh, places like Qatar, or where, in most cases, places that most people don't even talk about, like Kazakhstan and other places, where you have um, offshore companies bringing in thousands and thousands of uh, immigrants for labor that uh, in most cases would not be taken up by a lot of people locally mm -hmm. but um, for the commercial companies that are in there it is good for the uh, for, for for their uh, commercial outcomes and though it can be seen as potentially exploitative one shouldn't forget of course a lot of the money that those migrants will earn they do repatriate it don't they so there is an economic benefit to the home country, the source country. 
Yes, absolutely. So the example I gave earlier about the Filipino communities, yeah. for example, that's the, the main driving reason for mothers to leave their children with their grand, you know, the children's grandparents, for example, so that they can provide better uh, quality of life for their families back home. And you see the same with uh, the Somali communities, for example. A lot of them have come here as refugees, fleeing conflict, but they are also a very, um, a, you know, a power block in terms of economically benefiting families and relatives back home. What's the dynamics of this? Is is the world's relative wealth evening out or will there always be poorer people who need to do tedious but functional jobs and therefore they will move to where those jobs are? Um, all, all societies will always be, be different but I think uh, the main problem that you are having globally is there's a lot of undercutting because of uh, trade laws, labor laws, and they, there are so many um, legislative restrictions on, on a lot of companies so it becomes easier for them to get a group of people who believe they don't have the right to raise the issues or maybe be litigious about them. Because uh, if you take any, it doesn't matter what country it is, there are people in those countries who will be able to do those jobs. But for those uh, corporations, there's no advantage in getting someone who's going to hold you to ransom when they demand um, their minimum wage, the living conditions and all. Yet all these people who are coming from outside are so disempowered, they don't usually complain. Is there not the prospect, though, that a lot of the jobs they move, migrants move around the world to do, are threatened by increasing levels of technology and automation? And so they, these kind, this kind of work, this kind of migration may, may phase out as more robotics come into our societies. Yeah, but we're, uh, I think, a long way away. For I mean, the technology is moving quite fast, but I think there's still a high demand for um, manpower, essentially, yeah. and, and uh, I think the economy is human still labor different. is still around for the time being. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but but also, if I can point out that um, where is like like um, Idlib says, said, this time that we are living in, the movement of people. Where, whatever, in whatever direction is the greatest opportunity and threat of our times. So what you are seeing is it's easy to, to believe that a lot of people that are migrating are doing so because they are uh, people of a, so, of a lower social class who only do certain kinds of jobs. Yeah. The, the majority of them will actually be people who go to those countries and start up businesses. You wouldn't be having the, the Apple or the iPhones that we have in the United States had it not been for, for migrants that came from Syria, for instance. So in almost every major global company that you see that does well, you will find that there will be immigrants or people that migrated who are beyond that. So even if technology changes, you will see that the majority of the people that do apps and startups and all these technological companies are in actual fact yeah. people who have traveled to yeah. those companies, to those countries. OK, thank you both very much, Idil and Tamsanka. Thank you. Now, we end with our Insight Bite, a little something that we feel you should know. And today, we can bring you the extraordinary story of a camera technician living in southern India who's become known as the Birdman of Chennai. In the wake of the 2004 tsunami, which devastated parts of Tamil Nadu state, Joseph Sekar's home became a relief centre for thousands of green parakeets. Since then, the bird enthusiast has spent half of his $13 daily paycheck on bird seed to look after his feathered friends. Mr. Zekar estimates he now feeds more than 8,000 green parakeets every day of the year. And that's all for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Inside.